Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I managed to go and catch a cold this weekend. And so today's lecture is brought to you by Dayquil. Um, and so if things don't make sense more than usual, it's the medicine talking, it's not me. Uh, I'm going to keep my mask on. And this is basically what I looked like during the pandemic. Uh, goofy picture and all, right? So what's up with the goofy picture? A team of nurses out of the uh, Oklahoma, I think it was at the University of Oklahoma Medical Center, discovered that if, so during the pandemic when the nurses were wearing all of their Darth Vader getup, right, and that, you know, they looked really scary, they found that stress hormone levels in their patients would go down if they put a smiling picture, black and white smiling picture on the front. And they brought in uh, physiologists and psychologists and studied this phenomenon. But basically, if the patient could see a picture of the nurse's face smiling at them, boom, all the stress levels went down. Um, they tried like DMV style pictures, right, where you're just not smiling, those didn't work, okay, uh, that sort of stuff. And so I, I read that and I was like, I'm gonna give that a try. So what I noticed is that if I wear this with a mask on, students ask me more questions. It's really weird. If I take this off, all of a sudden I, I like, I'm not human anymore, right? Does have a mask? I am more handsome in a mask, I'll tell you that. Do you guys know that? People uh, score higher on the, um, good looking scale, so to speak, if they're wearing a mask versus when they're not wearing a mask. So there you go. Dating advice from your physics professor. Um, but yeah, so I'll just wear that. And it also is evidence that I will do anything, anything, right, for you guys to help the learning process be smoother, even if it makes me look like a dork in public. I don't, I don't wear this outside of the classroom, just in case you're wondering. All right, so we'll see if I can get through this without uh, coughing in several lungs and um, realize that uh, you are not responsible for a couple sections in this chapter. I gotta cut some stuff out in order to make it through. We're gonna cover chapter 10 today. We're going to uh, do the test autopsy tomorrow. We're going to start chapter 16 on Thursday. I know that sounds like a big jump there, but if you look at the schedule, we're going to start doing chapters out of order here because the author <laughs> put them in the wrong order uh, as far as linking subjects together. So our unit here is going to be simple harmonic motion, waves, and sound. So basically, we're going to study wiggles for the next two and a half, three weeks. And um, it all starts here. So this motion that I'm about to show you is very different from any motion that we've had so far. Right? So I've got a mass on a spring. We can do this horizontally, we can do it vertically, it doesn't make any difference, we'll get the same result. It's just easier to do a, a vertical spring here live. Okay? But if I take this mass and I pull it down, I've stretched the spring. Right? Okay? And now what happens if I let go? It's going to go up and it's going to come back down and it's going to go up and it's going to come back down. Okay? And now, I have a motion that repeats itself, okay? But it's not the repeating motion so much that's new, because quite honestly, we've done repeating motion before. If I take my ball on a string, and I put it around in a circle, this is a motion that repeats itself, right? It starts at one spot, comes all the way around, and then does that whole motion again. And it should come as no surprise that these two things are actually the same thing, okay? this repetitive motion. Now, what's going on here that is rather unique and something that we really haven't fleshed out is that, well, the acceleration is constantly changing here. So let's see if we can't get some of this onto the page in terms of describing what's going on. So first of all, springs. Springs are new. Um, and there is a there is a rule, a law, we call it Hooke's Law, H-O-O-K-E-S. It was a person's last name, okay? 
And what Hooke's law tells us is the force that a spring is going to exert uh, on an object. Now, that force is going to depend on two things. The x here is a distance. It's how much this spring gets stretched okay, from its equilibrium point. So when the spring is just resting right there, stop wiggling, okay, right about there, right? This is the equilibrium point for the spring. And this is, this is important that you realize you're not allowed to pin zero for springs. <laughs> springs have a built-in zero. Okay? We can't just put zero anywhere. We have to put zero at the resting length of the spring. Now, this zero point can change. Ah, here we go. Okay? If I add more weight onto this, do you see how the spring stretches a little bit more? Okay, so for this new system, I have a different zero point. And so getting your zero, understanding where your zero is, it's always like the rested, relaxed position of your spring mass system. Okay, so I have this stretch, and what happens to the force as I give it more stretch? Does the force go up, go down, stay the same, what does it do? It goes up, right? The more distance we have from equilibrium, okay, the stronger this force is going to be. The K in there, that's called the spring constant. The spring constant basically tells you how strong the spring is. Um, for example, Jello has a very low spring constant. Slinkies have very low spring constants. Uh, the springs in your bed have higher spring constant. This is basically like spring stiffness. How much do you have to really push on that spring? And the units of the spring constant are newtons divided by meters. Uh, if you solve it for K right there. The minus sign, the minus sign is a reminder. You're going to see me, you're going to see your book, you're going to see people on the internet. We will constantly do this and it's very annoying. We will just drop that minus sign when it's convenient. <laughs> That's because the minus sign isn't like an absolute minus sign. It's a reminder that if I pull down, if I make x negative, right, below this zero, which way is the force from the spring? Is it up or down? The spring wants to pull the mass down? No, the spring wants to pull it up, right? Okay, so I pulled it down, but the spring is pulling back up, right? If I let go, it's gonna, it's gonna pull it back up, right? Same thing, if I go positive x, which way is this spring gonna push or pull? Down, right? So that, that minus sign right there, that's more of a reminder to anybody looking at that, that springs always oppose their, 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 their stretch Okay, or compression, they always act against it. When we analyze it, we typically use like a free body diagram and we'll figure out the direction. You, ne you almost never plug in negative kx for anything. You might put in kx for the force as the magnitude of the force. But that minus sign is again there to remind us that the direction of the force and the direction of the stretch are opposite each other. Okay, so. This is kind of one of the central equations that tells us what's going on with this motion right here. But we also knew, know about Newton's second law. Okay? And so we can take a look at the acceleration of this system based on that force all by itself. If I just say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at just the spring. Now, I know gravity is acting here. Okay, I, I understand that. Gravity is giving our stretch. But once we've stretched the system out and found its equilibrium position, gravity doesn't make any difference. And you'll just have to trust me on that one. But what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that our acceleration, if I just solve this for acceleration, our acceleration is no longer constant. That equation over there in red, there's a, there, there's a k over m out there, right? A spring constant divided by a mass, and that's just along for the ride. But functionally, 
Can you tell me where the acceleration of this mass is zero? At, at this equilibrium point, right? Okay, as this thing bounces up and down, okay, when x is equal to zero, the spring is neither pushing nor pulling on that mass, and so therefore the acceleration is zero. So where is the acceleration the biggest? What do we have to do with x in order to make a big? Make it big, right? And so we call, like if I pull this thing down, and I stretch it, I don't know, say 10, 15 centimeters, okay? And I stretch it down to here. We call that the amplitude. This is the most that this system will ever get stretched, okay? And so if I let go, the mass is supposed to go about the same height above. So amplitude above and below. Right? The direction of the acceleration will change. But what's important to know here, right, is that when I'm at an amplitude, acceleration is going to be the biggest it's ever going to be. Because amplitude is the furthest from equilibrium this system is going to get. Okay? So our acceleration constantly changes from a value of zero in the middle to some maximum value on either end. And up to this point in this class, we have only dealt with accelerations that remain constant. Accelerations, like when we slam on the brakes, we always tell you the acceleration is constant, right? So that's not necessarily true, but it's a good approximation. Well, with this motion, we can't lie anymore. <laughs> okay? We can't cover it up with approximations. This is a constantly changing acceleration. Which leads to some actually quite beautiful, but rather complicated math. And if you haven't had differential equations yet, count, count your lucky stars, okay? Uh, it's, it's the math that get, is beyond calculus. And so basically, I'm just going to give you results here, right? Just, I'm going I'm to dodge a bullet of really nasty mathematics and just give you some results of what's going on. So everything in a box is going to be the toolbox, okay? So first of all, we're gonna write down our uh, maximum acceleration, the biggest the acceleration could ever be. There is, a, there is a shorthand, okay, that we use where we use omega to tell us what, um, Basically, instead of writing k over m, because k over m appears everywhere, the spring constant divided by the mass, we will use omega instead. And, and I, I know you've already seen omega. What was omega before? It was an angular velocity, wasn't it? Okay, so we're sneaking some circles back in here. More on that in a second. Uh, I should, let's not do the maximum yet. Let's just do the acceleration. The acceleration, okay minus omega x, okay, is what is a way to figure out what the acceleration is at any position. What I'm trying to do here is develop a new kinematics toolbox, but I need to do it so that it models this motion right here, right? This motion that has a constantly changing acceleration. And so we're going to use some new words, some new terminology to describe what's going on. I've already given you amplitude, right? The, the furthest that anything is going to be from its um, equilibrium position. There's another term that we call frequency. Frequency is like number of wiggles per second. Wiggles isn't a very scientific term. We would say cycles, okay? But a full cycle would be leaving here and then coming back down to the bottom. That would be a full cycle. I can also do a full cycle from the top. <laughs> I can leave from the top and come down and come up. That would be a full cycle. But basically, it needs to return back to uh, not just where it started, but the condition it had when it started. So for example, if I, if I start it from the middle and I push it up, okay, it would go up come back down, but now it's not at its initial condition. It's moving down at this point. It's not moving up, so it has to come down, and then come back to this position to be a full cycle. Frequency 
counts the number of those cycles in one second. But there's another measure that we've already used, and we used it when we did the tennis ball, anything that was in an orbit, right, or going around in a circle. What do we call the time it takes for this thing to go around once? The period, excellent, right? We use period to talk about pendulums also, right? The time it takes to complete one full swing back and forth. Does this object have a period? It sure does. A time it takes for it to go up and down. So it turns out that frequency and period are inverses of each other. So for example, if it took uh, two seconds for this object to go up and down, period is measured in seconds, what would its frequency be? Like how many cycles would it do in one second if it takes two seconds to go up and down? Half a cycle, right? Because it would take one second to go up, right? And one second to come back down. Okay, let's do another one. Uh, if the period were um, one-tenth of a second. So this thing moves really fast, right? What would its frequency be? Frequency is the inverse of the period, so that's one over one-tenth. And what do I get when I do that? You get ten. The units of frequency are inverse seconds or hertz. But I know you've heard of a hertz before. Where have you heard of a hertz? Monitors, refresh rates in monitors, 144 hertz, meaning that it refreshes the display 144 times per second. Uh, gigahertz of a processor. Uh, Intel just released a processor that runs at 6.2 gigahertz, meaning 6.2 billion computational cycles every second. Uh, just asking about the labeling of this equation. Is mm. that 1 divided by t? Yes. One, one over t. What do f and t stand for again? Frequency, f, t is period. Period. Yeah, capital T period. All right, so we're, we're laying out some of the language that we're going to use for talking about this, okay? And now I'm just going to start throwing some results at you. The position as a function of time, so this is a little bit like our kinematic, like first, second, and third equations, is equal to amplitude times the cosine of omega times t. You might also see this written as a sine omega t. Don't panic, okay, as to whether it's sine or cosine. What's going on here is, number one, this is a sine or cosine function. Like, if you want to describe how this thing is moving, it's moving like a sine or cosine. It's a wiggle, right? Okay? If I took this thing while it was bouncing up and down and I dragged it <laughs> across the board, I would get that telltale sine or cosine function. And indeed, when you do the differential equations, <laughs> sines and cosines all fall out. Okay? But... The sine or cosine difference has to do with where you start. When, when time is equal to zero, right? If you're starting at amplitude, you use a cosine. What's the cos? So if I put t equals zero into that first equation up there, a cosine omega t, what's the cosine of zero? It's one, right? Got a 50 50 chance, right? It's either zero or one. Cosine of zero is one. And what's one times the amplitude? It's the amplitude, right? Okay? So you use cosine when you start the system. Like if I pull it down and I let go, I would use cosine to describe what's going on here, okay? Where do you think we use sine? when it starts at zero. Because what is the sine of zero? When t equals zero, if I use a sine function, what's sine of zero? Zero. zero. What's zero times a? Zero. zero. It starts at zero. 
So sine or cosine is basically the starting position. Most of what we're going to do is going to start at, at the end. Right? We, we pull it out, we let it go, right? That's a cosine function. That's why you'll see it written a lot in your book as cosine. But I, but I wanted you to be prepared because I know you guys use other resources other than the book and things like that. And so yeah, I didn't want you to go, oh, Mr. Bailey, this guy uses sine. What's going on there? Well, it just it depends on where it starts. Okay. All right. So the position as a function of time, the velocity uh, turns out to be negative omega a sine omega t, but if you started with sine, it would be minus omega a cosine omega t. Anybody that's been in calculus can see what's going on here. We take derivatives of sine and cosine and they flip. And then the acceleration as a function of time would be minus omega squared a cosine omega t. I'll put all the one, all the standard ones in boxes, but this would be minus omega squared a sine omega t if you started right with sine. All right, so they just kind of flip flop there. But notice we're kind of picking up things in the front here, which allows us to write down things like maximum acceleration. We already know the maximum occurs at either end, but we can actually determine what it is because we know that sine or cosine can never be bigger or smaller than one, negative one. So the most the acceleration could ever be, if this is equal to one, is omega squared a. That's our maximum acceleration. Our fastest speed we can ever have is going to be omega a. So if we know, right, if we know omega, which is the, which is k over m, right, then I can figure out how, where, you know, how fast this is going to be going. Where is it going to be moving the fastest? Let's flip that question. Where is this thing have a velocity of zero? It's the top and the bottom. It's at amplitude, isn't it? Because that's where it's turning around, right? Down here, it's going negative, and then it's going to be going positive. And to go from negative to positive, what do you have to do? You've got to pass through zero, right? Same thing at the top. The top, it's going up, and then it's turning around and coming back down. So to go from a positive velocity to a negative one, it's got to go through zero, right? So we know that this object has maximum velocity at amplitude. It has max. What's the acceleration out here? Zero. <laughs> well, is it? Where was the acceleration zero? Right here at the zero point, right? Not at rest. The thing is constantly moving, okay? But it's neither being pushed nor pulled here. So the acceleration is the biggest here, meaning the speed isn't changing right here. So where's the maximum velocity? It has to be right here. If the velocity is zero at either end, where is it the biggest? In the middle. Okay, acceleration is zero in the middle, so where is the acceleration the most? at either end. All right. Did I give you all the... Almost, yes. And the equation under the velocity one is that multiplication dot? Yeah, it's a minus. Thank you. My messy handwriting. There we go. Carrying that minus sign around. Okay, so the things in the boxes represent a toolbox. I'm going to throw one more on you, okay? Uh, we'll get to it in just a little bit. It comes from energy. Uh, but I just want there to be a complete toolbox on the screen for you, right? And that's V equals the, um, let's do it this way. Let's do omega times the square root of um, A squared minus X squared. We'll write it like that. And I will write that a little bit clearer. a squared minus x squared. There we go. Okay. So we'll pick up one more here, but at least you have it. 
on that screen. Everything in black is your toolbox. Okay, so there is a, um, this toolbox is locked. <laughs> there's a padlock on this toolbox. And there's a key that will unlock the tools of this toolbox. And it's the key that you need to find, okay, somehow, some way. And I don't know if you can tell what the key is. What symbol is appearing in almost nearly all of these equations? It's omega. Omega is everywhere. And so a lot of our problem solving process starts with finding the key. If we can find the key, then we can basically do anything because we know all of these, all of these boxes right here are, are basically everything solved for us. We know what the velocity is going to be at any time if we know omega and the amplitude, right? We know what the velocity is for any position. We know the acceleration for any position. We know how fast, the fastest it could ever be. We know where the acceleration is going to be the biggest. There's all kinds of information that's already solved for it. Simple harmonic motion is the toolbox that physicists will reach for first when we are confronted with something we don't understand. And the reason we reach for this toolbox is because it's already solved for us, right? The work's all been done. The differential equations have been met. And so we get, we'll get really desperate to turn anything into a spring. Um, um, in, the, in, the in the early 1900s, 1910s, Physicists were struggling with this new concept and idea called the atom. They didn't know what atoms were. And so you might have heard about this in chemistry. When you're talking about an atom, one way to model that is to basically treat all the electrons a little bit like springs. And the electrons are the springy, springy, bointy, bouncy, and crystal lattices and all that kind of stuff. Well, when physicists sat down and said, oh, what's the atom? They're like, I don't know, it's a spring. Okay, let's see what happened. What happened is quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics was the result of treating atoms like springs, okay? Things that wiggle, okay? And, and we develop our quantum mechanics now to the point where we can build cell phones and do all kinds of stuff. So, so I've watched engineers use simple harmonic motion to describe what happens like when a car bumper hits another car. I mean, that doesn't look like a spring at all, right? Like it just, it, the bumper is just gonna like crush, right? Well, while the bumper is crushing, it's compressing like a spring. So even for just like a quarter of the period, they'll reach for this because by golly, this is done. So let me show you some of the, so, uh, uh, one way, okay, to use this toolbox for solving things. Um, yeah, I've got this video right here. Okay, um, this is a first person view of somebody doing something and uh, it should hopefully become obvious as to what they are doing here in just a little bit. Any idea what this person is doing? There's a buggy jump, right? Okay? And they didn't just unhook themselves. I want you, you know, some students get really worried. Right? Okay? So, let's talk about bungee jumping, right? Let's use this example to show you how to use the simple harmonic motion toolbox, but also bring back some of our old toolboxes. <laughs> Fun. Uh, so, what you're saying about <clears throat> you don't have to like substitute any other variable. You'll have to substitute things in, but there's no, there's no like, um, 
Like the math is pretty much straightforward. It's all right there in that toolbox. It's solved for us. We might have to rearrange something to get somewhere, much like our kinematic equations we had before, right? Maybe we need to find alpha or something or a, right? So we have to do omega minus omega naught over t or something like that. But but in terms of anything that looks even vaguely like that, I pretty much already know what the answer is. So it's not like we're creating our equations. Like yeah, we don't have to create equations anymore or any of that kind of stuff. This is very much a return to like chapters two and three, where we just have a set of equations, they're done for us, right? And we can just apply them. Unlike chapters four, five, six, seven, right, where we're developing equations, which we did in dynamics and energy, right? These equations are done, they're well understood, they're well known. Just make everything a spring and your life is going to be better. Okay, so, good question. What do we got going here? <sighs> Remember, we want to unlock the toolbox by finding a... Oh, oh, I forgot one. I did forget one. This one's important. Omega and frequency are related to each other. Do you remember what the units of omega were back in uh, when we did circular motion? It was a radian per second, right? Okay, it was an angle per second. The units of frequency are hertz, right? A hertz is a one over a second, okay? And remember, what are the units of radians? It's a unitless unit, right? It doesn't have units, it doesn't have dimension. So radian per second and a one over a second are very closely related to each other, related through two pi. And here is a point where I have to admit something, okay? Um, I, I hope it comes as no surprise that I've been lying to you. Now, now not in ways that matter, in the sense, okay, but I have I have been lying to you all semester, saying things like you know physics is easy, it's going to be okay or whatever, right? I've been lying because I've been withholding information from you, the full force and fury of physics, right? I'm keeping all of that at bay, and I'm, I'm sweeping things under the rug and telling you bedtime stories like acceleration is always constant. Okay, well, I've told you today acceleration isn't always constant, but here's another kind of big lie. I told you that omega was angular velocity. It's not. It's angular frequency. I know, I know you can hate me later, okay? Most of you are just sitting there going, so what? <laughs> okay? Angular frequency, radians per second, okay, is the actual, it's just, if I told you about frequency back when we were doing circles, it is too soon, right? Too soon. So, you'll, and I had to be really careful when I was teaching the circular motion stuff to call it angular velocity. I kept wanting to call it angular frequency, right, okay? But it's really a frequency, so, so when we say frequency, we will use the unit of hertz, which is a one over a second, a cycle per second, something like that. But when we're specifically talking about omega, which we talk about a lot, we will use the term angular frequency, the angular frequency of blah, 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 right? So if you hear just frequency, that's straight up linear F. When you hear angular frequency, now we're talking about omega, and it will have units of radians per second. Okay, back to our example problem here. Okay, so what's going on? We need to unlock the toolbox. And to unlock the toolbox, we need to find omega. And so we're looking for things that will help us find omega. And the two main ways that we find omega is either by doing... K over M, I want to make sure I do what the book does. No, I lied. 
your book does the square root of k over m. Actually, all books do. I just read my notes wrong. That is the day close speaking. Make sure I've got it right on that page. OK, so we need to go back. Give me a second. This might break. I need to go back to this slide. Here we go. And fix it. This is equal to the square root of k over m. Everything else is correct. There we go. Sorry about that. This is what happens when you take decongestant. All right. Yeah, I got everything else. This is negative omega squared times x. Yeah, got that one. OK, I am now good to go. All right, turn that one off. So that slide should be OK. Back to this one. All right, so square root of k over m, uh, or, or, Omega equals 2 pi f. Like those are the two main ways that we unlock toolbar. Not the only ways, but they generally are the ways we use the most. Okay, so let's see. Do they tell, I usually go for 2 pi f first. Do they tell me anything about time or frequency? Like how long it takes for this bungee jumper to do something? They're asking me for how long. They're asking me to solve for time, aren't they? So time and the frequency thing there isn't going to really help me. Remember, frequency and period are inverses of each other, so I could write that like this. Okay. So, but, but I don't know frequency. I don't know time. So those aren't going to be useful to me in my quest to unlock the toolbox. Do I know anything about the mass? Yeah, we, we know that the, the bungee jumper, right, okay, has a, has a mass. They gave us that mass, didn't they? 70 kilograms, okay. Did they give us the spring constant? No, they didn't. But they did tell me something about force and stretch. Kind of. Do you see how they gave me a five meter stretch? They're trying to tell me something. I wish they could be more clear about it, but they're not. So without the bungee jumper on the bungee cord, let's say my spring is the bungee cord, right? Okay. Then it's got whatever length it has. Okay. 20 meters. Okay. When we hang the bungee jumper on it, it stretches five meters. That's like, that's, this is without the bungee jumper jumping, okay? It's just that they've calculated the stretch of the bungee cord when 70 kilograms has been put on the cord. So, Hooke's law gives us a relationship between force applied and the stretch of a spring. Rearranging that force divided by the stretch will give me the spring constant. Well, what's the force? I mean, kilograms is not a force, it's a mass. It's the weight, isn't it? The weight of the bungee jumper, mg. So in this problem, that force is mg. The stretch, right, is given, so that's 70 times 9.8, all divided by five meters, okay? And that's gonna give me 137.2 newtons per meter for my spring constant. So a lot of times you'll be searching for spring constants and you're looking for information about like force needed to stretch a spring, force needed to compress a spring, okay? Look for that force, find out how far it stretches or compresses the spring, and boom, you can unlock your toolbox. Because once we have the spring constant, 
And once we have the mass, can we find omega? It can be the square root of 137.2 divided by 70, which is going to give me 1.4 radians per second. So there's my omega. And now that I've got omega, now that that's in place, I can do just about anything. Okay. But before I get there, I'm just, how long does it take for the bungee jumper to return to the equilibrium of physics? Okay, now I need a picture. I've unlocked my toolbox. Now I want a picture. So I've got like bungee jumper sitting up here. Okay. They are, so there's a 20 meter distance between where the bungee jumper jumps and where the bungee cord begins to get stretched. Does that make sense? So like, if, if, if this is 20 meters, right, okay? The bungee jumper starts up here, right, jumps off, and are, are they stretching the cord at all in that 20 meters? Not really, okay? We're fudging a little bit here, okay? But the bungee jumper isn't, so like up here when they're slack in that bungee cord, there's nothing happening, right? What, what motion is this? If there's no stretch in the bungee cable, what are they doing? It's free fall. And we know how to do free fall, okay? We've done that before. But as soon as the bungee cord begins to stretch, now we are in simple harmonic motion. So we're going to take... We're going to say this is the zero point, right, for the bungee cord uh, getting stretched, okay? I'm going to say for simple harmonic motion, okay? And so everything after this is going to be springiness, okay? It's going to be stretching that bungee cable. And the furthest distance that this bungee jumper is going to get is the amplitude of the oscillation. Now, I saw somebody out there mouth five. It's not five. Five is not the amplitude, okay? Five is what happened when we statically just put the bungee jumper on the spring and it stretched it that far, okay? This bungee jumper is going to be going uh, whatever speed they're going, and then they're going to stretch the spring, right? So it's going to be further or shorter than five. Hopefully longer than five. That would be a very abrupt bungee stop if it was five years. Okay, so... In order to do this, um, to be able to do the part in green, which is the simple harmonic motion part, I need to find out how fast this bungee jumper is going when they enter that simple harmonic motion. So to do that, I'm going to use free fall. Okay? And we've done this a lot where we've solved for how fast something is going when it falls through a height h. So I don't want to spend any time. It's the square root of 2gh. Square root of 2 times 9.8 times 20 meters gets me 19.8 meters per second. So that's how fast the bungee jumper is going when they hit the equilibrium point of the spring. So what have we just found? What in the toolbox have we found? V max, right? This is the fastest this person is ever going to be going. Because as soon as they get to this point, what are they going to start doing? Slowing down, right? The bungee cord is going to begin to stretch. And this is our simple harmonic motion part, okay? Up here is free fall. Here is simple harmonic motion. This thing is now starting to slow down. The fastest it will ever be going Is right there. That's supposed to say max. Terrible handwriting. V max. All right. So we know that our V max is 19.8 meters per second. Okay. And so we can find our amplitude since V, whoa, V max is equal to omega times a, we can rearrange this, 
to find our amplitude. It's going to be 19.8 all over 1.4. Amplitude is measured in meters, so this becomes 14.1 meters. Okay, so what does that mean? They start up here, they come down here, they begin stretching the bungee cord. They've already fallen 20 meters. How much further are they going to stretch from this point? 14.1. So how high above the ground should this bungee cable be? <laughs> At least 20 plus 14 plus 1, right? <laughs> right? And preferably much, much further than that, right? To be safe. But if this thing were only 20 meters above the ground, we'd be in a world of hurt, wouldn't we? Okay. So there you go. You open your bungee cable business. Don't do these calculations. Do them much better. Okay. Um, but we're not, we're not quite to where we wanted to be, right? They, they're asking me for how long does it take for the bungee jumper to return to the equilibrium position. So they don't care about how long it takes them to fall. We're just asking for the time it takes from the point where they start stretch, stretching the bungee cord, coming down, hitting their amplitude, and then coming back up to this point. Because as soon as they hit this point, <coughs> are they going to be in simple harmonic motion anymore? A bungee cord is not a spring. It's a cord. It acts like a spring as long as it's being stretched. But what happens when you try to compress a cable or a cord. It doesn't, right? So this person is going to be free fall, free fall, free fall, free fall, simple harmonic motion, simple harmonic motion, simple harmonic motion, free fall, free fall, free fall, free fall, free fall, simple harmonic motion, right? Okay? This is a pretty complex motion. They're just asking us from here when they begin to stretch all the way down and back to this point, how long does that take? Well, how much of a cycle is this? To go down to an amplitude and back to equilibrium, that's half of a cycle, isn't it? So if we can find the period for this motion and divide it by two, we know how long it's going to be spending there. Yeah? So I know my V max, I know, sorry, I know my amplitude. And now, can I find out what the period is? Oh, I didn't even need my amplitude. Why did I find my amplitude? The period, I just found it for fun, is equal to 2 pi over omega, which is 2 pi divided by 1.4. That period is 4.5 seconds. So what's the answer that they want? <coughs> It'll be 2.25, if I did my math right, seconds. Part of the difficulty with simple harmonic motion, it's actually pretty straightforward. Like, literally, you find omega somehow, which is the hard part, usually. And then everything else just starts falling out. You just look for the, what they're asking you to solve for and look for. You need to have the conceptual model that surrounds what's going on. You need this picture in your head right here, okay, of this motion right here. In this problem, this example I did for you, we only used half of the motion, but that's okay, right? It, it was the half that we needed for solving this problem. Um, I, this is a fairly complex one in that it, it had both kinds of motion in it. Um, I seem to get in trouble either way. If I do examples that are too easy, you complain that the homework's harder. And then if I do problems that are too hard like this, you complain that, you know, it was too hard, Mr. Bale. But anyway, I gave you an example that's kind of the most difficult, hopefully, that you'll ever encounter, right? And hopes that it prepared you for the homework. Yeah? I just don't understand. Um why we're dividing it by two when their both sides aren't equal. Okay, so the divide by two comes from the concept over here. A period would be an entire, like starting here, it would be down, up, and back down again. But they're only asking us for from here <coughs> back to here. And that's only half of the motion. So it doesn't matter if it's shorter? Nope. 
Good question. All right, let's explore some things further here in hopes that we can get a little bit more clarification uh, about what's going on. And I want to introduce uh, another form of energy that we can keep adding to our conservation of energy setups. So let's just review real quick. What kinds of energy do we know about? There's kinetic. And now there's two kinds of kinetic energy, isn't there? We have the straightforward linear kind, one half mv squared. And then we now know that there's rotational, one half i omega squared. On the potential energy side, up to this point, all we've had is gravitational potential energy. Well, now I'm going to give you elastic potential energy. If I take this spring and I stretch it, just hold it here, does it have potential energy? If I let go, is, that, is, 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 it going to get, is it going to move? Okay. Where did the kinetic energy come from there? It came from the energy that's stored in this spring. So elastic potential energy, usually potential energy of a spring, that's what the little s is there, is 1 half kx squared. So there's the new form of energy we have to keep track of if we're keeping a, keeping a list here of all the energy. What this means is, right, in our work non-conservative equals energy final minus energy initial, we have to, there's four questions we need to ask about final initial, right? Is it moving? Is it rotating? Is it higher or lower than... Right? Does it have elevation, age? And then we also have to ask the question, okay, is there a spring involved? Right? Is there anything that's like a spring, a bungee cord, a trampoline, anything like that, that's storing energy, okay, in a compression or a stretch? The equation that I dumped on the... Um, screen to complete the toolbox comes out of considering conservation of energy. And I just want to remark about it here, okay? Because this is a pretty useful equation for finding. This equation right here allows you to find how fast something is going, a simple harmonic oscillator is going, if you know where it is. So, when x is equal to zero, when the, when the object is at the zero point right here, what's its speed according to that equation? I put a zero into that equation. I've lost, ah, there it is. B is going to be equal to omega times square root of a squared minus zero. What's, what's a squared minus zero? A squared. What's, a, what's the square root of A squared? A. And what's omega A? Two what? <laughs> it's V max, isn't it? But that not that what we said? Isn't the speed maximized when it's going through equilibrium? Okay. What's the speed down here at amplitude? When it gets to this point right here, how fast is it going? Zero. Let's check and make sure that that works. What's, uh, so if x equals a, what's a squared minus a squared? Zero. What's square root of zero? What's omega times zero? So I'm going to guess that this equation works everywhere in between. Okay. So again, that's an example of how things are solved for you. Yes, you've got to use the equation and plug stuff in, maybe rearrange. But in terms of we don't have to reinvent the wheel, when applying conservation of energy, it's uh, it's really, really nice. All right. Where's my... Oh, before we do an example. Smiling under here. Quiz time. We haven't done one of these in a long time, have we? 10.1. We'll use... We'll do this. Oh, I might run out, run out of time. I'll, we'll see how far we get here. Okay. 
Do I have my notes for this? Get your calculators out. I don't think I have notes for this one. That was uh, two points. Okay. Remember, we want to unlock omega. Or we want to unlock the toolbox. So we need to find omega. It's, it's going to be hiding in here somewhere. Okay. Um, do we know the mass of the object that's on the spring? Yeah, they gave you the mass, two kilograms. So if I'm going to get a little picture here, um, maybe my picture looks a little bit like this. There's a spring attached to something, and then there's a two kilogram mass sitting on there, right? They tell me that they pull it to a position of 0.2 meters and then let go. What's that going to be? Yeah, that's the amplitude, isn't it? They pull it to there and let it, it's like, it's like taking this and pulling it down and letting it go, right? Okay. But before that, they also say they pull it that distance, 0.2 meters, and they need how much force to do that? What are they trying to tell me? It's force and a stretch. Is there a way for me to find something if I know force and how much it got stretched? What's the toolbox say? Yeah, spring constant, right? So we did this before. We can find the spring constant. It's going to be 20 divided by 0.2, which uh, is that 10? 100. What's 20 divided by 0.2? 100 newtons per meter. Okay. How does that help, Mr. Bela? Well, remember, omega is equal to the square root of k over m, isn't it? So that's equal to the square root of 100 over 2 kilograms, or the square root of 50, whatever that number is, radians per second. Oh, ooh, okay. So now I found omega. What do, what do they want me to find? I haven't even looked to see what they want me to find. I just wanted to know. What, okay, so, I, so and then I also know the amplitude is 0.2 meters. So that's just a piece of information. Okay. Yes, uh, with initial position. Okay. Okay. And they're also giving me another clue, right? They've pulled it down, and then they've let go. Is that going to be sines or cosines in our equations? It's cosine. We're, we're, we're leaving from amplitude, right? Okay. So what do they want? They want K. Oh, <laughs> I already found K. It's right there. Frequency F. I know the spring constant. I know omega, and I know the amplitude. Is there a way for me to find the frequency F? What equation in the toolbox can help me find F? Omega equals 2 pi F. So that means f is going to be equal to omega over 2 pi. And that's the square root of 50 over 2 pi. I have no idea what that number is. But we got it, because that's just numbers. I really wish I knew where my notes page for this one went. That would have been nice. Uh, square root 2 pi, 1.13. Hertz. So there's the frequency F. Uh, v max. What does the toolbox say V max is? I don't know, Mr. Bailey, you took the notes away. Omega times A. So square root of 50 times my amplitude 0.2. I got 1.4, call 1.41 meters per second. It's a V max. I put in standard units, so I know I'm going to get standard units out. A max is going to be omega squared times A, which is 50 times 0.2, which is going to be uh, 100. It's going to be 10 meters per second squared. Uh, boy, I'm just on a roll here, right? E t 
total. Oh, that's uh, the most or maximum energy this thing can ever have. Well, what's the furthest this thing can get stretched? Amplitude, right? So energy is one half k x squared, but to get the most of it, I would have whoa, k a squared, right? That's the total energy right there. Let me fix what I did here. There. Oh, that totally messed up. Let's do that again. The total one half k a squared because of the amplitude being in there. So that's one half times my k, which is 100 times 0.2 squared. So that's 50 times 0.2 squared. Two squared. It's two. Oh, I should know that too. Okay. Uh, joules. What else do they want to know? Ito, find the speed and acceleration of the object. So two things. I want V and I want A when the object is at 0 0.067. Okay. So now I need equations that link speed and position as well as velocity and position. So speed and position. What equation links speed and position? It's got to have a V in it, it's got to have an X in it at the very least. Does that link speed and position? Sure does. This is going to be omega square root of 50 times the square root of my amplitude, 0.2 squared, minus, and then I put in 0 0.067 squared, and I would put that all in my calculator. I'm not going to do that. For the acceleration, it's going to be omega uh, squared x, and that's going to be 50 times 0 0.067, whatever that number. I, I, can, I can keep going, right? Once I've got omega, finding all of these things is a matter of looking at the toolbox, maybe rearranging some equations and going for it. Again, keys here are keeping, right? this idea, right, of this bouncing mass. And you're going to see pictures in the book or online of them doing it horizontally. That's fine. On a frictionless surface, we're not doing any friction in here or anything. It's called simple harmonic motion for a reason. It's simple means no friction. Okay? But as long as you've got the concepts and ideas of this motion in the background, applying the toolbox okay, becomes a, a puzzle fest of figuring out what you've got, what the toolbox is, and where they want you to go. I saw a hand out there. So, yes, one. Why do you square the 50 when you're doing velocity? Square the 50. Velocity right here? Yeah. I have the square root of 50. Right, it's omega is equal to the square root of 50 up there. So I was just, I was being lazy and didn't put square root of 50 in my calculator to find out what the number was. Because it's just a number. All right, uh, we're going to leave it there. I we're almost finished chapter 10. It's just concept. A little couple of things about concepts about residence. And so we'll cover, we'll cover residence on Thursday and then go immediately into chapter 16. Remember, we're skipping. Chapters 11 through 15 for the time being. We'll come back and get them later. Did you say resonance or resonance? Resonance.